Hello, everybody, and welcome to our annual special bonus videotaped version of the Reason Roundtable podcast in honor of our annual webathon. It's the 16th year in a row that we have asked you, dear listeners and viewers and readers and other types of people, even commenters sometimes, uh, to uh, consider giving us a tax-free donation to the Reason Foundation, which publishes everything that we do. I'm Matt Welch. I'm joined from left to right here in our Burbank studio by Nick Gillespie, Catherine Mangue Ward, and Peter Suderman. Hello, everybody. Howdy. Hey, Matt. Happy Wednesday. It's not our Burbank studio. I lied. We're in Washington, D.C. We're in Washington, D.C. with a beautiful table here. Um, yeah. Made by a uh, donor. By a Webathon donor. Next, Scott Uwine, whose name I mispronounce every opportunity. Scott is very difficult to figure out. What we're going to do here today is basically answer your questions um, that you submitted to us. Many, many questions. We're not going to probably be able to get to all of them, but we'll see what we can do with our usual speed and grace to <laughs> sorry <laughs> answer them all. Um, uh, where are you trying to stump us and and uh, and etc. But first, we're just going to give you a little. I should say. But first, we're going to give you a little uh, bit of uh, reason for the reason season, which is to say uh, why uh, you should uh, consider giving us a tax-free donation by going to reason.com/donate, um, and also what you might get when you're there. Why don't you lead us off the robot with the mostest, Catherine? Thank you, Ward. So here's the thing. Um, basically, all other publications are bad, and I say that as somebody who reads a lot of news all day, every day, and who even has uh, some publications that she enjoys. But I think if you want a combination of genuinely serious investigative reporting, real fact checking, and uh, just like non-insanity that we really like bring together those three key components and that uh, it's a lonely place to be. And so you should support us in our efforts to do reporting and journalism and analysis that is non-bonkers. Peter, what is your reason for the reason season? Well, I think the reason that people should give money to reason is to pay for staff. And so this is this is like a, a very fundamental, but I think underrated benefit of donations is that you need people to produce stuff. And so if you like reasons stuff, Whatever that is, if you if you like Reason's articles or their podcasts or the events or the whatever project and you want more of that, then there's got to be a person to write that article or to speak into that microphone or to manage that project. And each individual person can only do so much. We try to get them to do more like we we extract. We're like we're 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 great, you know, sort of manipulative, horrible capitalists who are just like give us more. Right. We're like uh, all of the staffers are like sponges and we're just squeezing them dry at the same time. Sometimes you've squeezed them dry and there's no more pro podcasts, no more projects, no more articles in them. And you need more staff. And so Reason has expanded. And that's why we are doing more now than we have ever done before. But we could expand even more and we can only do that with your donations. Uh, speaking of Led Zeppelin's Lemon Song, uh, Nick Gillespie, yep. uh, you've now had enough time to prepare for this question. What is a good reason that people should donate? Why to... am I here? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am going to uh, go with the idea that reason is your voice in public debates over politics, culture, and ideas. Uh, we are carrying the libertarian uh, sensibility in as big a context as anybody does. Um, so if you believe in libertarian ideas, if you believe in free minds and free markets, support reason. We're out there all the time. Another thing that we do that's related to that is that we help create the next generation of libertarians. Uh, I started reading reason in high school. It was very foundational in the development of my sensibilities. Uh, so don't blame me. Blame Reason Magazine, I guess is what I'm saying. But it's it's a, a really powerful uh, transmission device to, you know, about these ideas to the next people. And Lord knows uh, we really need as many libertarians as we can find going into 2024 and beyond. Uh, and I will add to those eloquent uh, missives. Uh, do it for the funny. Um, considering that we write about politics and statism and other horrible things that the government is doing to everybody at all times, uh, I think we bring a fair, uh, a fairly high percentage of funny stuff. Remy videos, the bro brothers brag this weird 
brain sitting to the next next to me doing live interviews with people. Um, there's a high uh, quotient of actual laugh out loud stuff that you can share with people who aren't libertarians. That's good, right? We like those things. Okay, uh, enough about us, uh, Catherine. We, we will get to what you requested to me earlier, but we're going to weave it into sure. the normal things. Let's start going immediately to difficult questions. This one comes from Guy Smith, or is it Guy? Uh, the question is, I'm wagering that Nikki Haley gets the GOP nomination. Ooh, um, I might take you up on that bet. Uh, if there are no major October su su surprises, she would likely beat Biden. So would Haley be a net positive or negative for libertarian ideology? Catherine, you're a lady. You tell us. Yeah. So I uh, have gone on the record on the Reason Roundtable saying that that sometimes Nikki Haley says words that I don't completely hate. Uh, I am also more deeply and fundamentally on the record reminding everyone that politicians are garbage and will disappoint you in the end. Nikki Haley is no exception. I think it kind of depends on whether the next four years are like war having years or whether they're domestic policy making years. And I think a Nikki Haley domestic policy would be largely non-horrific in most areas. And that is the nicest thing you will ever hear me say. But um, I really do not trust her to manage America's role in the world, especially given the kind of MAGA pressures that would be on her from the party. Um, and I think that um, her performance, uh, you know, in her role as the U.N. ambassador is a hint of this, but that she would be um, maybe like less of the angel of her better nature and a little more of the MAGA devil on her shoulder as president, if I had to guess. Uh, Nick, I would like you to add to that and we'll weave in as another question, two of the price, one from Stephen Jackson, which goes to uh, does Reason have any comments on the recent endorsement of Nikki Haley by Charles Koch, who is a significant supporter of the Reason Foundation? And might Nick do an interview with her? Well, I would uh, be happy to talk to Nikki Haley uh, anytime, any place. Uh, Behind the backstop, three thirty. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Let's do that. Um, I don't have any uh, opinion on uh, Charles Koch, uh, you know, or his group's uh, endorsement of Nikki Haley. Uh, what I like about her is she's basically the only candidate who's really talking about national debt and uh, deficits which implies entitlements and things like that. I don't think that she her reforms are the ones that I would choose, but good for her on that. Suderman, you're a, a reformer at heart. I agree with what Catherine said. She would be better than the other plausible alternatives on domestic policy and quite worrying on foreign policy. Also, Reason doesn't endorse candidates. Why not? Because we are 501c3. You huh. know what else is true about 501c3s? Let's hear it. Uh, donations to them are tax deductible. Wow. So... We will not be endorsing presidential candidates, which might make you want to give us your money. And if you gave us your money, you would be kind of stealing some of it from the tax man. So it's a win-win. It's not stealing. It's totally legal. It's totally legal. Uh, and uh, uh, would just add to uh, any of that that uh, Nikki Haley um, at least gave one of the better speeches in 21st century American politics when she advocated for bringing the Confederate flag down. Uh, from South Carolina State House, which was nice, um, good on her. Uh, yeah, except... she seems like a competent, normal person, which is actually a huge, uh, like a qualification in this field. And if she wins president, we're going to hate her too. So that's, much because she's what we still going to be a conservative Republican, also, which is not what we are. All right, Doug Stewart, who is the CEO of the Libertarian Christian. Institute asks an on-brand question. Uh, I've been a listener to your show for several years now. Thank you, Doug. I've always appreciated the insight and analysis, etc. I've been a libertarian for nearly two decades now, and when I first entered the arena, it felt as though the movement had a mostly secular, non-religious, and certainly non-Christian flavor to it, despite there being a non-trivial number of Christian intellectual influences in the movement's history. But nowadays, it seems we find that many are coming to libertarianism while also holding on to their faith. My question for you is this. Do you think the liberty movement has seen a fair share of growth by those who aren't anti-religious and are simply making an effort to find a way to make their faith comport with libertarian principles? Or is it just my confirmation bias since I run an explicitly Christian liberty organization? What say you? Catherine, why you lead us off? Yeah, I mean, this is absolutely a trend at Reason as well. We have um, an increasing number of young staffers who are some flavor of Christian. And um, there are two possible explanations for this. One is that, yes, it reflects something real in the movement. 
And um, if I had to make up a story about why that is, I would say it's because Christians are uh, no longer a the dominant or even maybe a dominant force in American society. They are therefore in a position to recognize and appreciate political philosophies that defend the rights of minorities. And hey, here we are, a political philosophy that defends the rights of minority populations. Theory number two is Stephanie Slade, yes. who uh, <laughs> is was at one time a lonelier um, Catholic in this case at Reason and who has uh, done excellent work, I think, in explicitly making the case for the compatibility of faith and libertarian belief. And uh, so maybe it's just Stephanie Slade. Uh, Nick, I feel like we've gone from atheists to lapsed Catholics to uh, whatever kind of practicing st- Catholics. Uh, Stu, or, I mean, yeah, you're uh, edging that way, aren't you, uh, Manuel? It's been a while. It's been a while. So, oh uh, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't okay. need the cookie. And uh, you know, the one thing I'll say to Doug is that there's absolutely no incompatibility between being a Christian or or being a member of any religion. I think of being libertarian. I uh, am fond of the idea that libertarianism, as we kind of understand it, or classical liberalism really comes out of 17th century uh, uh, England and the Civil War over uh, the role of forced worship uh, and whatnot in in the Church of England. So I think you see, uh, and David Bowes, I believe, talks about this in his Libertarianism, a Primer uh, book, but it, you know, discussions of the right of conscience to worship God or not as you see fit is kind of foundational to what we talk about here. So I don't think there's a contradiction at all. I got to say, as a lapsed Catholic uh, with five of seven sacraments, which is pretty high up there, uh, it bothers me, though. Oh. The religiosity bothers me. Really? Yeah. Okay. Doesn't bother me, people. I mean, it makes it easier to shop on Sunday, but yeah. yeah. Can I uh, can I make the controversial case that actually the like super observant Catholic libertarians and the psychedelic libertarians are just uh, two parts of the horseshoe waiting to come together and that it's just all freedom of conscience and you guys all want the same thing and they're doing, they're eating the cracker and you're doing the drugs, but it's the same. So maybe don't be scared. Peter, you're a cracker who doesn't do drugs. Um, (laughs) Uh, That's that's exactly how I would describe myself having grown up in northern Florida and gone to school in Kentucky at a very religious college. Uh, I didn't graduate from there, but I was there for five semesters. Uh, One of these uh, colleges that has like a curfew every night and you have to, there's mandatory chapel three times a week as part of your uh, curriculum. The teachers pray at the beginning of class. So I grew up uh, pretty deep in the conservative evangelical world, uh, listening to Focus on the Family, as well as an awful lot of NPR, actually. Like those were the two kind of uh, radio influences. Did you listen to Christian rock? Oh, oh yes. Uh, yeah. Almost exclusively, I could uh, probably do the whole rest of the podcast on Tooth and Nail Records. We won't go there. Do um, not. So I beg you not to. But but what I want to say is, uh, even though I am not part of that world anymore, I, I really like working at a place that can have the lapsed Catholics and the hardcore atheists and the people who are just sort of like not part of this, but also the really deeply religious folks. And this is one of the 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 joys and the beauties of reason style libertarianism is that it allows all of these different ideas and these different ways of living and these different theories of what makes a good life to coexist, not just peacefully, but in a way that is friendly and like you, you get something out of it. Everyone gets something out of it, right? It is beneficial to all. And I am, I am much better off for working with Liz Wolf and Christian Britschke and, uh, and Stephanie Slade. Uh, and I, I, I'm also much better off for working with Catherine Mangy Ward, who is like a, like a real like, man, there's absolutely nothing in me that like, that you could call a soul. Like souls don't even, like souls are, it's like a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, what a capital of a country, right? <laughs> that's I didn't it. Are you the Korea? Are pivot, you but... the name of a Pixar? Did movie? you have a born again experience? I think I would have said that I had one when I was fifteen. Yeah, and did you have a dead again experience, or did it just kind of fade? It just became less useful to me. No, I'm curious because I've I've talked to a number of born agains. I find religion fascinating, uh, you know, for all sorts of reasons, and not in a snotty way either, but. You know, so most of the people I know who have left born again Christianity, it, it was like a slow fade, not a, a reverse Damascus Road experience. I I think that is mostly correct. There were the, there was probably a moment when I realized, oh yeah, 
that's not me anymore. Let's go to a uh, kind of a mirror image of this question from John Pillow, who uh, asks uh, the uh, suspected Satanism is on the rise. On <laughs> the suspected Randy and influences on Brad Bird, which was mentioned in this week's roundtable, got me thinking about. J.D. Tuchili, no, it's not J.D., it's a Jerome Tuchili's uh, 1970s book. It usually begins with Ayn Rand. Uh, perhaps a better for, question for him, but wondering if Ayn Rand is still a relevant entry drug to the libertarian movement. Uh, Nick, why don't you start that? Yeah, I think so, but I think uh, she has competition now. Uh, from Ron Paul uh, and kind of all the emanations of him, as well as places like Reason Magazine as an institution. I, um, but uh, Ayn Rand is still a major uh, tributary. Uh, Catherine, you're the resident Randian on, at the table. Yeah, I think Nick is right. She's around. She's still doing her part. Uh, she seems to be um, more like the second thing people encounter, not the first thing. Like the first thing is like a meme or a Twitter account or a podcast. And then when people want to learn more, sometimes they find Rand. And I think that's actually fine, too. Um, it might, among other things, prevent the um, kind of um, closed ecosystem of objectivism from being people's first encounter with uh, this actually very like open and like blurry edged cluster of ideas. Um, and I would add to that, you know, like uh, criminal justice outrage stories bring a lot of people in um, uh, war. Um, right. a lot like of I just think more people become a libertarian by hearing like a am I being detained joke or something yeah. and then like slide their way into a book instead of starting with the book. It's uh, stuff on the Internet that brings people in. these days, Right. That's, that's to the, all things. the whole uh, the whole uh, ball of stuff on the Internet. Right. All the different things. It's the podcasts and the TikToks and the memes and the tweets. This one comes from Christopher Ashley. Uh, says, uh, greetings from Kentucky, y'all. Uh, I have only recently come to the libertarian liberal persuasion. Well, he's not saying well, why or how. That would be interesting to know. After spending some years as an ardent Republican and others as an ardent Democrat. In terms of electoral politics, did I pick a weird time to become a libertarian? <laughs> Uh, Peter, what do you have to say about that? Well, uh, you capitalized libertarian she, there, capital yeah, yeah. L, and it is always a weird time <laughs> to become a capital L libertarian. On the other hand, free minds and free markets, reason style, lowercase l libertarianism, it's always in vogue, right? I mean, it's or it's always it's always in. It's always in style, right? Like it's a it's a it's or a, maybe it's, a it's always out of style. No, it's yeah. a... <laughs> Buy low, sell high. That's a <laughs> it's a it's a good necktie. It's a comfortable pair of blue jeans or boots that'll last you for the rest of your life. Like there's, it's always in style. It's always the right time Ralph to become Loren a lower. Libertarianism. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. This is a piece. This is a hair. Lowercase L libertarianism is her is a heritage piece that you will hand down to the next generation. I couldn't hate this pitch for libertarianism yeah, more, no. but um, yeah. Dude picked a really, really weird time. <laughs> Lowercase L, capital L, whatever. Um, we are in an absolutely bonkers political realignment moment, and um, the two major parties have aligned uh, solidly uh, in a way that could be described as just not libertarian. Like, that's like the shortest, quickest, or at least not liberal in the classical sense. Um, I assume that that is part of the reason that uh, this letter writer has uh, evolved his political identifier preference. But um, no, weird, really, really weird time. Um, so in case things feel weird now to you, I guess you could take some solace in knowing that uh, maybe it won't be quite this weird. Forever. OK, but if this is a weird time, then when was the normal time? Like a couple of years ago when that uh, like cannibalistic uh, vampire in Florida Satanist yeah. was running. You as, just, you're, now it's the you, QAnon shaman is running bingo? for a libertarian. So. You're playing a secret bingo yeah. game with yourself to Having mention said Satan as much as possible this podcast. All of, well, Satan be. is my uh, sweet master, right? But uh, <laughs> was that? Did I say that out loud? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Speaking of that, you know, up. having uh, uh, having said this, you know, Javier Malay uh, was just elected president of Argentina, which is pretty big within the and U.S. Weird. Big and weird. It's yes. a weird time. Uh, uh, it's not no, a bad time, but totally it's a weird, weird time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think electorally in the United States, we, you know, this is kind of a lull um, compared to, uh, you know, maybe uh, 2016 with uh, Gary Johnson. 
Uh, but I suspect, you know, building on what Catherine was saying, the realignment is taking place. And if you have, Matt, this, uh, you may recall the book we co-wrote, uh, The Declaration of Independence, but Drink. at a certain point when both parties become anti-libertarian in every possible way, uh, that pressure gets pushed up to the uh, surface. And I think we're on the verge, uh, I'm sounding like Peter now, of a big bubble of uh, libertarian ideas coming up. Uh, I like the optimism. Um, yeah, oh, that's a, not optimistic. It's a, <laughs> it is not. Uh, we have a lot of other related questions about libertarianism and entry points and and uh, things to think about it. But let's mix it up with some questions about pizza. This is from Andy Jabour. Uh, the question is: uh, I grew up making, delivering, and supervising at my local Domino's during high school and college, and have a lifetime love of pizza. Wow. I thought there was no but in that section. Yeah. Uh, that's funny. Uh, when interviewing people, I often ask them to describe the perfect pizza today. I ask each of you, what is your um, uh, perfect pizza? He also uh, puts in a, um, a, a beseechment to get more active on threads. Um, that's pretty hard. Not going to happen. That's not, not going to happen. I, the, the only reason the I now. go to threads is to repost or whatever they call it, rethread. Uh, Andy Jabor. If there's a social media site called Daddy Wags, I'm in there. But other, other than that, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get my rags there. Uh, uh, Peter, you are the pizza expert. You just wrote about this for Reason Magazine, from what I understand. That is correct. I wrote uh, like a long kind of deep dive into the history of pizza, and in particular, frozen pizza. Um, and so it, the argument of the piece is that the very best pizza is frozen pizza, and in particular, that it is Red Baron frozen pizza, which is, I believe, the number two frozen pizza brand behind DiGiorno, right? We all know it's not delivery, it's DiGiorno. DiGiorno was a, a big technological really improvement pizza. when it debuted in the mid-1990s because it was the first rising crust pizza that you could just put in your oven and have at home, and that allowed them to compete with delivery. But in fact, Red Baron is just better. It's less caloric, it's less sort of bready and heavy. Uh, and it's also, the big thing about Red Baron is it's pretty good and it's right there. And this is, this is is my perfect pizza, the pizza that is in my hand when I want pizza. And that's the, that's the great thing about pizza historically and today is that it comes in all, all sorts of forms and form factors, right? You can go and pay $40 for just an absolutely exquisite, expertly made, you know, uh, heritage, what, uh, Italian style, uh, like uh, classic, Ita some sort of like crazy artisan he, pizza he in Brooklyn. Yeah, no. It's not frozen. It's, He's like, he yeah. lacks the language. Right? That's right. Uh, or you can pay three ninety nine at your local grocery store, pulling something out of the freezer case, putting it in your deep freezer downstairs, forgetting that you have it, stumbling into your house at twelve thirty in the morning, and thinking, "Oh, what was I going to eat?" And twenty five minutes later, you have Red Baron, and it's pretty delicious, and that's the best pizza that you could possibly have had at that moment. Nick, do you have any uh, Italian-American uh, objections to what you just heard? Yeah. And uh, Matt, I want to bring it back to Little League because I think you'll appreciate this. Uh, so I played for a team in Middletown, New Jersey called the MPs. The MPs? And what did it stand for? It stood for Middletown Pizza. Oh, yeah. And uh, Middletown Pizza had very good pizza. Uh, so did Nino's on Route 35 near the old Pathmark. I will wager that any slice that is from a non-Domino's, non-Pizza Hut style chain, and I've lived in a lot of shitty parts of the country, so I know all the Mr. Gaddies and all the pizza buffets that are all terrible, but any slice from an independent retailer, preferably who has at least six vowels to every consonant in his, <laughs> his or hers first or last name, uh, those slices in New Jersey are going to be superior to just about anything anywhere else in the planet. Uh, I will just vote for me and Ed's Pizza in the LBC, California. Get the Canadian bacon. Catherine, you have pizza thoughts or not? Uh, my pizza thoughts are uh, the best pizza is anchovy with capers, but mm -hmm. I want to give a shout out to the like maybe four slices of Hawaiian pizza that I ate last night during our epic season finale of Dungeons and Dragons. I realize this makes me sound like a contrarian monster to say both anchovies and Hawaiian, but honestly, they are the best pizza and I will fight you. You just uh, made me have to scroll up from where I well, was you going. You really to. don't have a soul. Okay. I had a friend in college who developed a taste for pizza with anchovies so that nobody a would eat them. Yeah, was, yeah, and I was like, okay. oh, that's that's pretty smart. That I knew people at the restaurant I worked at in college uh, who smoked cloves for that reason. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so this is uh, related here uh, from Liam Smith. Uh, since Catherine brought up D&D mm. in the Monday Roundtable. How did he do that? What would you consider to be your alignment, race, and class if you were playing a character as close to yourself as possible? Catherine. First of all, if anyone says uh, anything other than bard at this table, they have to <laughs> roll for deception because we are all bards. Um, there are libertarian paladins, I think, and uh, I have some affinity for the Warforged, which is a race of robot creatures. But um, I'm currently playing a human rogue who is multiclassed into a bard who uses intelligence instead of charisma as, her, as his spellcasting modifier. And uh, it's a great character, and that's probably me also, I'm sorry for everything I just said. Also, chaotic neutral. Uh, Peter, is this a language that you speak? Yeah, so I'm currently playing a rogue warlock half orc. <laughs> <laughs> who is? Who, who is? Non binary. Who is non binary? Yeah. Uh, but I don't think that character reflects the truest and deepest that me. That character sucks. If I can just that say. character oh, wow. is great because that character drives all of the other characters mad. Oh, that's so unlike which you. is the goal of Dungeons and Dragons is to break the game. Uh, but no, for the I, I've been playing this character for a couple of years, and the uh, for many years before that, my first character was a half elf bard named Chinar the Bardarian. Chinar, of course, being my favorite Italian bitter liqueur, uh, and he was very much chaotic neutral. Uh, I uh, was a dungeon master in the 70s, but I've forgotten everything except for the funny side of dice. What about uh, Stratomatic? Uh, I mean, I mean, the, 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 what, uh, we, do we, we only have an hour. Um, so, all right. Like, I'm not yeah, roll to, that die, Matt. I'll, uh, I will take all the teams and divide them up. I, it doesn't matter. Um, I, Smith, I, I'm going to give him a two for here while I'm cutting off Nick, um, uh, unless you are. Oh, you, I just you, wanted to you say have that. Avatar no, here, no, but I'm a big fan of Gary Gygax. C.J. Ciaramella has written about him for reason, but check out Gary Gygax, who, like all brave pioneers who created uh, more or less Dungeons & Dragons, was hounded by the federal government because he was too beautiful for this world and uh, he had a lot of other problems. Also because a lot of people thought that he was promoting Satanism, which is, I think, the reason that you brought him up. <laughs> maybe, oh. maybe, you know. Sensing a theme. All right. I, I did also, if I may, just, and this goes well, out to one of my uh, college friends uh, <laughs> who, uh, when we played Stratomatic Baseball and uh, whenever Jerry Grody came up, he would always roll the dice and say, Grody, Grody to, the to the max. max. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there's only one way. It to, had a spell. It had a spell power. Way to do it. <laughs> um, I was all about Ripper Collins, obviously. Uh, let's go to individual. <laughs> and it's trained important. pig for pie trainer. Oh, yeah. And the uh, classics. Uh, let's go to some individual uh, questions as if these ones haven't been. Uh, again, from Liam Smith. Nick, what dead Liam person? Liam Smith. What de well, I mean, you chopped them up into a single sentence questions. Goes to the front of the line. What dead person would you most want to have on the Reason Interview podcast? Satan. Yeah. No, <laughs> Satan. Uh, and I take this from Jesus. a book that was popular among my evangelical friends. Satan is alive and well and living on planet Earth, man. Well, so it, Satan doesn't. Uh, he or she. I think Satan might be non-binary. I don't know for sure. But, um, you know, I would have liked to, at this point, I would like to have uh, interviewed John Lennon. Oh. Yeah, just because he uh, is a fascinating, weird character who gets more interesting the deader he is. Uh, I, I would just be about UFOs, I hope. That yeah. Was, uh, uh, yeah, and macrobiotics. Uh, Catherine, related question from uh, Josh Dalton. Uh, who is a libertarian or libertarian-leaning economist or columnist that you would love to add to the Reason ranks that has thus far been too busy or disinterested to write for Reason? That's a loaded Ooh. question. Wow. I mean, I absolutely have a list. Like, I keep a Google Doc yeah. of people like this, uh -huh. and I— Who's at the top? <laughs> I mean, I I love me some Jane Coaston, and she doesn't seem as busy these days at the New York Times as she a she, you a columnist or economist. She's definitely a libertarian. Was it columnist or economist? You said uh, columnist or economist. Okay. Yeah, okay. and uh, I think she's awesome, and I think that she would be happy here. So Jane, if you're listening, which you're definitely not, call me. Uh, let's go with Liam Smith again for Suderman. A single sentence. He did it. He wrote pithy questions. Peter, what one cocktail 
would you most want every one of your listeners to try just once? A really well-made Mai Tai. And the reason is that a really well-made Mai Tai is a beautiful, wonderful drink that shows you just how good a a drink that has become trashy and uh, kind of uh, seen as, uh, oh, this is just a dumb beach drink that maybe it's blue. God, we don't even know what's in this thing. If you make it well with a a, a well-chosen blend of rums and fresh lime juice and good orgeat, uh, you can make yourself or you can purchase Small Hands Foods makes uh, good orgeat and just a little bit of extra syrup in there and follow the like actually follow the the recipe the original recipe and and make this drink the right way fresh mint crushed ice the whole thing it's incredible and i think this the a, a good mai tai shows you what the delta is between trashy versions of cocktails that aren't thoughtful and really thoughtful, really well-constructed versions of those same drinks. You know, I think the cocktail that is best is the one that's in your hand at 2 a.m. I don't know, maybe for... uh, uh, Sometimes that is true, but the thing is that you want to go to a place that will put a good cocktail in your hand. Like, for example, My Basement. Mai Tai, the Mai Tai, like how alcoholic is that drink in the original version. It's uh, like not super, actually not very no? alcoholic. This yeah. is it has two ounces of rum and a half ounce of Cointreau or Grand Marnier or, or Isn't it like dry first or something. Nope. There's no one fifty one in the no. original Mai Tai. There is two two ounces of rum that's gonna be in the you know forty to forty five percent alcohol by volume range and then most of those orange liqueurs are forty percent alcohol by volume as well. Uh, let's go to a frequent uh, correspondent Leonard Goodnight. Uh, says, hey, y'all, in the most recent podcast, y'all talk, a lot of y'alls, Leonard. Yeah, what's this, you all? Uh, about moving to Florida or California if you couldn't live where you do now, D.C. and New York, for reference. And, and just to be clear, we were having a Florida versus California uh, theme podcast. Um, but let's take the coasts off the table. If you had to move to somewhere outside of coastal elitist land, where would you go? Uh, Alaska is also an acceptable answer because it's coastal, but not elit- elitist coastal. Um uh, who who did, did the, everyone get mad at the most? I think Catherine uh, was the person that people got mad at. Yeah, the she most. wanted the Bay Area. The Bay Area. That yeah. was the, what, that was, so where's your? I'm just gonna answer the uh, like the inland Bay Area, which is Denver, and yeah. uh, that is uh, the city of my birth. Fun fact about me. Really? Um, yeah, I lived there huh? for two whole months before coming here and never leaving. Wow. But, um, I feel like it's got good libertarian vibes that have been sadly overtaken by bad progressive government, but that we could, nah, maybe we can free state free state our way into bringing some of that back. Peter? The realistic answer to this is the Lexington, Kentucky area where I went to school for a number of years and where I have a bunch of friends. I love the countryside there. The cost of living is low. It, there's a surprisingly great food scene and there's a lot of really good whiskey. Nick? Uh, I don't know. You don't know. Yeah, I don't. Know. He did I his don't time care. in Oxford, Ohio. Yeah, I, I've lived longer in Oxford, Ohio than any other part place in my life. Uh, Ohio is kind of a high tax state, but actually, this kind of calls back to our previous conversation. The cost of living was so much cheaper there. It was, you know, it was relatively uh, good. I don't know myself. Uh, Phoenix, I, I, I have an absurd taste for, even though it's completely what about Vegas? Un- uninhabitable. I you were, or I don't Palms, like Vegas. Well, Palm Springs. Palm is Springs coastal. is still coastal elitist uh, enough. Uh, somewhere in Texas, I'm not sure which one. Uh, maybe San Antonio. Um, uh, is Texas on the map for this? Cause, yeah, sure. Oh, then so I would probably go with Austin. Yeah, Austin. That sounds that sounds about right. Seems uh, like most of our answers were cheating, to be honest, except yeah. Peter's. Uh, Denver is fine. I would have gone there. It's just a little, little cold. Uh, all right. Uh, Morgan C. Harper. Uh, hey, Roundtable. I've recently enlisted in the USMC. It's the Marine Corps, I think. Uh, as a combat engineer and have been struggling to match my political beliefs, libertarianism, of course, to the realities of my life. Coming from a lower income family, I don't have many other options to access schooling or training without the GI Bill, that being provided by the military. My dad was also a Marine serving in Iraq, Kuwait during 2003. He often speaks of his regret in his role in such a corrupt war, and I think of this often. He's a devout libertarian who really formed my way of how to look at politics, and I'm looking for input from good people like yourselves. I don't see my beliefs and the way things are going matching at all. Is joining the military mutually exclusive to being libertarian, especially with all the pointless wars of the past 60 years? 
I hope this wasn't too long. Please paraphrase. Uh, Yins, have a good one. And I hope this was a decent question. Yes, it was a very good question. Catherine, why don't you lead us off? So uh, I read a lot of science fiction, and I think one of the questions that a lot of science fiction explores is, or a sub a subgenre at least explores, is uh, can you be a cool, badass soldier type person and also not be bad? Um, and uh, of course, libertarians believe in the right to self defense. Um, so I do think there is there is a role for armed defenders of personal liberty. Uh, I unfortunately do not. I personally would not be able to square libertarian beliefs with being a U.S. Marine in 2023. Um, I think that, as we were saying earlier about a potential Nikki Haley presidency, but certainly either a Trump or a Biden presidency, the likelihood that your commander in chief is going to send you off to do something profoundly anti-libertarian is 100 um, percent. And so uh, I think that that is kind of a deal breaker. Um, that said, I, I you know I think that there are ways to live a libertarian life or a life guided by libertarian principles within a deeply authoritarian framework, and that that starts with freedom of conscience. So we're back to the Catholics and the you know psychedelics fans uh, and the Montagues. Uh, I I want I want there to be libertarians in all institutions, yep. uh, and I don't even uh, reason, uh, even reason <laughs> on occasion, even on this reason. Reminded uh, that uh, Ron Paul at his peaks in 2008 and 2012 was pulling more donations supposedly from uh, armed force members of the armed forces than any other candidate. Gary Johnson also in 2016 yeah, pulled so a whole lot. I don't think it. there's yeah. any uh, necessary contradiction. Um, and then the question goes back to uh, you know the, the the great speech which has nothing to do with the Marines but uh, Mario Savio the founder of the free speech movement in Berkeley or not the founder but the spokesman who talked about you know there come times when you have to throw your body on the machine and that means if you're a Marine uh, as well as if you're in lots of other jobs you know sometimes you will have to say no and become you know act on your conscience if what you're being asked to do is wrong. But I don't think there's a necessary uh, contradiction. So I grew up in the panhandle of Florida, which is a place that has a very large military presence. And in particular, the place, the area where I grew up was the home to a lot of officers and then enlisted men um, in, uh, who worked at Eglin Air Force Base, which is the research and testing facility on the East Coast for the for the Air Force. Grew up near a bombing range, like literally went to sleep with sorties flying over my, in my house and like could hear just the, the low thump of bombs going off around 9 p.m. And so this was this was the world that I grew up in and growing up around that and around uh, around a sort of career military officers and enlisted men uh, gave me a great appreciation for the dysfunction of government and bureaucracy, but also a great appreciation for the people who serve in the military because almost to a one, they are competent, they're good folks, they're people you want to have around and have on your team and to be doing stuff. And I mean, you know, sort of, uh, it's working with veterans, uh, just, you know, at the restaurant jobs that I worked at there. I mean, it's a, it is an institution that does a good job of training people to be competent in a lot of ways. Uh, it is also an institution that should exist in some form. Like the, I am not so much of a, an anarchist or so much of a limited government person that I think that we shouldn't have a military. And so I don't think that it is necessarily incompatible to serve. And I also think that it's, uh, like Nick said, it, it's good to have libertarians in those institutions and it's good to have those ideas um, be be present uh, at, you know, in all parts of government. And thank you for your service. Yes. Damn it. Uh, Colin Blunt says, I think the 2024 election may be kind of important given the domestic and international unrest of the moment. That said, I don't feel like voting for Shaky Joe or the Orange Demon. Um, I don't know who the libertarians. Is that a uh, Bruce Springsteen song? I think <laughs> it's, it's, it's the name of his new tour with Barack Obama. Um, I don't know who the libertarians are even running. Kind of pissed at them after the Meghan McCain tweet. Um, voting for the, um, which I'm not going to explain, but God, it was bad. Voting for the stunningly narcissistic and corrupt Trump or the more socially acceptably narcissistic and corrupt Biden, which may be elder abuse, <laughs> are equally <laughs> unappealing. Uh, so my question is, is there any reason to favor either of these two miserable choices, Catherine? You can always choose none of the above, and that's what I'll be doing. She's so boring, Nick. You yeah, can. I don't. I mean, you can. Like, yeah. he just made a wonderful case for not voting. He's true. He's right that the election is important, but it is not. 
doesn't mean you have to give your vote to these monsters. Yeah, I don't think you have to vote for either of them. And the world will get better regardless of who is elected president. It might take longer or shorter. Uh, but, you know, the fact of the matter is that social change happens uh, not uh, every one funeral at a time, but it happens sometimes because of politics, but mostly in spite of it. And uh, who is president matters. But what matters more is that people are libertarian and are pushing forward to increase the sphere of individual autonomy and, uh, and freedom. Peter, are you going to make this a three for three? Uh, well, I agree with Catherine that you don't have to vote. But the way I would say, the way I would address this question is, if we end up with a Trump versus Biden presidential race, as now seems likely, if one way to think about the question is, who has the bigger downside risk? What are who has who? Which presidential candidate is going is uh, has this sort of a could cause the worst consequences? And I think. Poss uh, libertarians, possibly even the four of us, might come to different answers ab about that question. But think about it as who, where, where are it? Neither of these folks is going to be good, but who could be worse? And maybe vote for the other person. Hmm. Uh, well, you go. Who, who do you think? That well, is? I'm not voting for either of them. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's it isn't the short answer to this question. Also, like, so maybe uh, we get you know January sixth on steroids, or maybe we get the Harris presidency like yeah, that, that no. that's the simple way to frame this right, I, think I think that's where don't threaten Demo me good time. democracy dies yeah. in darkness there uh it, so the the literal question is is there any reason to favor either um and yeah. and I, I think I just gave a reason to favor either the uh, I think the, 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 the answer, answer is, is yes if if one of those things scares you more than the other one and you live in a there's state. a reason to disfavor one more than the other perhaps maybe then to favor one but that's sort of the same thing uh, Frank Olechnowitz. Um, that, doesn't, that doesn't sound yeah. right. <laughs> uh, there's whole like uh, letters in here. Or Nobody saying, don't gave even try to pronounce it. Ma right? Many yeah, people yeah. did say like have had it, Matt, or yeah, some variant, yeah. which I appreciated. Uh, asked to me the Mises Caucus. That's a rump caucus, the governing one actually within the Libertarian Party. Seems to be the ideologically pure wing of the Libertarian Party and critical of the more pragmatic wing. Is the Libertarian Party unique in the tension between ideology and pragmatism, or does this plague all political groups? Is there any group which has thus far been immune, and how was that accomplished? Nick, you follow the Mises Caucus stuff. Uh, yeah, I would uh, commend people to watch uh, Zach Weismiller and, and my documentary from 2022 about the Reno Reset. And we've interviewed people like Angela McCardle and Michael Heiss, who's the head of the Mises Caucus. I don't believe that it is necessarily the most principled. They have principles that they talk about and try to adhere to. But for instance, uh, you know, the Mises Caucus and the Mises Caucus Influenced Libertarian Party has stopped talking about immigration, uh, you know, expanding immigration as a central part of a libertarian political platform, which strikes me as odd. Um, it seems to me like it's a no brainer to say more people should be allowed to come here and work legally, live and work legally. They don't get welfare, et cetera, but whatever. Um, and I don't, but I don't think the Libertarian Party is alone in having. Uh, these kinds of uh, tensions. What has happened is that the bigger parties no longer really have to bother to adhere to principle because they have the votes. So, uh, you know, certainly the Republican Party, even before Donald Trump, it wasn't clear what their governing, you know, what their uh, ideal principles were. Uh, but we know that they were just big government conservatives. And liberals, uh, you know, really are not as necessarily as hell bent on having the government control every aspect of our lives as people often attribute to them. As having covered third party people for way too long, um, I, I think the split isn't between ideologically pure and pragmatic. And I agree with Nick that it's I'm not uh, uh, ready to, to declare the Mises caucus wing to be the most ideologically pure in this case. Um, but uh, it's between. In minor parties, um, it is between people who are trying to get the minor parties the most votes and even elect people in some of the many tens of thousands of, uh, of uh, elected positions in this country and those who want to use it as a vehicle of promoting what they see is the most purely distilled version of that block's ideology or, or belief system. And that that is an eternal 
tension, and it's always exacerbated by the fact that uh, marginal political parties, just like marginal ideologies, and I'm just using this as a as a visual of how many people are at it compared to the rest of the of the mainstream, um, attracts marginal people. Um, and uh, you know, hands straight up uh, in, in that description. This is not me looking down. So uh, uh, th I think that that is a perennial. Uh, let's go to a, uh, some more uh, individual ones here. Uh, leaning on the frivolous ones, not frivolous, but um, I don't think so. The the mass have one, you mostly. answered a question yet? I'm directed to, to you. I'm going to answer one right now mm -hmm. uh, from uh, Andra Mount. Uh, uh, why is laughing at a donor? It's, it's, not it's at all. Snorfling. Not at all. I was uh, just the, uh, um, pronunciation. Yeah. Uh, why and how did you get to the Czech Republic? Oh, this is good for uh, Catherine. Wait, you lived in? I know it's hard to believe. Czechoslovakia. Or was it then Czechoslovakia? If you wait yeah. for the end of the question. Yeah. Uh, more details equals better. Uh, funny enough, no. More details does not necessarily equal better. I would direct you to a piece that Catherine commissioned of me um, a couple years ago called the Anarchic interlude um, that was a sort of a discussion of the generation of people around my age, uh, Westerners who flooded into Prague at the end of the Cold War and kind of before the beginning of the next thing. Um, and most of us uh, who did that did it just because we turned 21 in 1989. That was really the biggest thing. And like, oh, all this is open. We did, we thought it was closed before. Well, that, that looks nice. That's interesting. Um, and that's, you know, it, there are, are potentially more highfalutin ideas about that. But, you know, 22-year-olds uh, going to a place that has the world's most delicious beer that costs 25 cents a beer uh, in a town that has never been bombed and is as beautiful as any place on planet Earth. Um, it's not a not a deep thought. It ended up uh, becoming more interesting than all of that Did for us that, individually. I mean, you had libertarian uh, stirrings and things like that. You knew about reason as a teenager, thanks to your stepfather. Did being in Prague make you more libertarian? And if so, in what ways? Well, I, I would say like more classically liberal. Right. Uh, like I was always an anti-communist, but like, uh, boy. Nothing makes you anti-communist like seeing communism or seeing the communism's aftermath um, and giving you a more radical idea of like what the state or what a government should not do and how government being involved with things warps every single part of human activity. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, to the extent where like it was a, our common joke, like every single interview that we did because we had a newspaper there would be, um, you know, people would explain what's happening at their place of work or their um, their line of their, their place in society. And they, they would say, well, after 40 years of communism, comma, you know, like everything's mangled. Uh, and it was. Everything was absolutely mangled because of 40 years of communism and, uh, and, and the choices that it foists upon individuals that, that are completely untenable. The number of people who are actually brave, and this is probably true even of our dearest donors and listeners, who, by the way, should go to reason.com slash donate um, to, uh, to, uh, to do that, um, and the people who would actually respond bravely to a totalitarian dictatorship who controls everything about you and your family's life, it's vanishingly small. And the amount of, of, uh, of respect and gratitude that we can have for those who do fight in those circumstances should be limitless. Catherine, this reminds me, um, is there a different giving levels uh, at the Reason uh, Webathon? Uh, and if there are, can you elucidate what they might be and, and how they differ? I would love to do that, Matt. Thank you so much for asking me. Um, yeah, we have a whole bunch of different tiers that you could be in. Um, they are cumulative. So however much you give, you get all the things from the tier below as well. Uh, you give us 50 bucks, you get a digital subscription and a little shout out on Twitter or Facebook if you want. 100 bucks gets you Reason branded socks. I am wearing mine right now. I'm not going to show them to you. You got to pay extra for feet. <laughs> for Wait, what level is that? Okay, that's, that's a whole new video channel. You get a Reason branded beanie, cute little hat. Those are great. Uh, Those are fantastic. You For 500 bucks, you get a Yeti tumbler. Uh, I don't exactly understand what a tumbler is. I think it's more mug-like than water bottle-like. Anyway, you get one of those. Thousand bucks gets you an invitation to Reason Weekend, where our donors hang out with us and we do cool programming and stuff. A torchbearer pin, and you can zoom with us in a kind of private, off the record, never to be released chit chat. Lots of feet. No right? feet in feet that forward, one either. Feet forward. We're calling that special no feet. segment. No feet. 
Uh, but you will five, put your best foot forward. Five thousand. I'm just pretending none of this happened. Five thousand dollars gets you lunch with an editor, and by an editor, I mean me. I'm great at lunch. You should have lunch with me, but also these jokers if you want, um, or any other editor uh, on staff. You can get a you can get a Fiona Harrigan lunch. You get a Robbie Suave lunch. Um, you get an Eric Bame lunch. Uh, whatever you want. Uh, and ten thousand bucks gets you a ticket to Reason Weekend for first time attendees. So uh, yeah, it's pretty good swag honestly, this year. And um, one reason that the swag is the way it is, is that we kind of ran out of new t-shirt ideas. So if you have t-shirt ideas, you could just like tweet them at me or DM me or whatever, because that well has run dry. In the meantime, socks, beanie, tumbler, and hanging out with us. Uh, all right. More individual questions from Larry Hastings. This to Nick. In a recent Reason interview video, I spotted Nick using one of those four color oh. pens. Please tell me Nick's elaborate system for color coding his notes. Green for financial matters, uh, red for thoughts on communism. Uh, has he considered upgrading to a 10 in one with a unicorn topper? No, that would be silly. Yeah. <laughs> Unicorns don't exist, but Bick. Uh, but but, Satan does. Uh, yeah, uh, is alive and well. She, it, they are, Z is alive and well. Um, no, I use these. I started buying this because I, I lose a lot of pens. Uh, but it's mostly I have large uh, ape-like hands. And this, you know, I think if King Kong had had access to a Bic for a color pen, he might not have been so angry. You're the gorilla grud of I the am, libertarian absolutely, movement? Absolutely, yes. I'm thinking right now, Peter, read my thoughts. Uh, Suderman special, uh, again from Frank Olechnowitz. Uh, uh, Peter, I like the idea of fancy cocktails that taste good, but I'm lazy and don't want to furnish a full bar. Can you suggest some? I'm going to edit that to one. Uh, simple cocktails using gin as an alcohol. Oh, yeah. You should make a bee's knees. It's gin, lemon, and honey syrup. You have to make the honey syrup yourself. It takes about 30 seconds. You just take three parts honey and one part water and kind of whisk it together for about 30 seconds until it's all consistent. And then it's two ounces of gin and three quarters of an ounce of fresh lemon juice and three quarters of an ounce of honey syrup. Shake it up in a shaker with some ice, then strain it out into a coupe. This whole process, if you have never done it, will take you four minutes. The second time you do it will will take you two minutes. After you've made the honey syrup and kept it in your fridge, it'll take less than one minute. It's very easy and it's really delicious. Hey, Peter, are you going to make us some of those bee's knees with the honey that was shipped to us this week by Reason donor John Mazur from his hives? Oh, yes, honey. Yikes. Uh, Brian Schnack asks, I'm naive enough to believe that Iowa can beat Michigan in the Big Ten championship and that many people are open to free minds and free markets if communicated in a language that speaks to them. So while wood chipping and chainsawing our way toward liberty uh, generates awesome memes, I suspect it turns off most folks, triggering the New York Times and attracting trolls while missing the mark. What prevailing libertarian metaphor or imagery most turns off the ideal audience. What is your favorite visceral metaphor to most effectively engage and activate libertarians' addressable market? And then bonus points if it's sports ball related to turn off the boss. Who has a strong feeling about libertarian metaphors? Catherine? Me. I have strong feelings about metaphors, Matt, as you know. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. So I. What would you say your feelings are like? Yeah. Are they like a tidal wave crashing into a mountain? So um, the metaphor that I like is uh, Mandeville's fable of the bees in which uh, the bees uh, all get together and decide to be uh, good and principled bees. And then their society falls apart because actually the thing that was keeping bee society together was their selfish pursuit of their self-interest. It's a, a good naturalistic metaphor and therefore avoids, uh, I think so often people want to use um, mechanistic metaphors for politics or the economy. We're going to cut it or restructure it or throttle it or give it the gas or whatever. And all of those metaphors are super disastrous because they are a fundamental misunderstanding of how economies work. Economies are organic, not mechanical. Um, I have a lot of feelings about this, but I'm going to stop talking. What I want to say is uh, I think that the letter writer is right. And that, um, you know, a bunch of dudes walking around with like a gun and a chainsaw maybe make some people nervous. And I get that. I am always, always, always an advocate for like being your friendly neighborhood libertarian and just kind of being cool about whatever people want to do. What were the bees making? Honey. Honey. It's a honey themed episode. For your cocktails. Or 
for Satan. Nick, you have I, I'm a big fan of walking into uh, supermarkets like Whole Foods, and especially for those of us who remember a pre-Whole Foods uh, kind of uh, supermarket experience. Uh, and Food it's like desert when, of the 1970s. Uh, yes, that's right. And Shoprite and you know, Albertsons and whatnot. But uh, now it's just like you go through the produce aisle. And there are so many choices, so many that are interesting and weird and wonderful and tasty and they smell good or they look odd and it's fascinating. And that is to me, that's what capitalism, that's what free minds and free markets brings you is a lot of interesting stuff from all over the world uh, that is endlessly fascinating and you can pick and choose among that. Who doesn't like a good produce section? Uh, eye pencil, good metaphor, uh, national divorce, bad. Uh, Graham Van Curen uh, writes, uh, Dear August Reasonites, which is more important constitutional advocacy from the libertarian's perspective? A, emphasizing the separation of powers and ensuring that each branch guard its prerogatives? Or B, emphasizing an expansive interpretation of the Bill of Rights, including such often overlooked gems as the Ninth and Tenth Amendments? Catherine, you're smiling, so you have to answer this. I just, I just like them all. All of those things seem important to emphasize. I don't think we have to pick just one, but um, if we do, I think separation of powers is something that people, from a rhetorical point of view, I think is probably the most important to emphasize. You learn that stuff in kindergarten, right? Like before your brain can understand anything about civics, anything about government, anything about anything. Maybe this is just kids who grew up in the D.C. area, but I think everybody like the first thing you learn in social studies about the United States government is like the separation of powers thing. And so it's deep in there. It's a thing that everyone has embedded in them that we can like call to and resonate with. And that is a fight we might win, because if there's one thing we know, it's that people in government don't trust other people in government and that we can like harness that. This is like some Federalist 10 stuff and it's good. So that one. Wow, I disagree. I think the Bill of Rights uh, stuff is actually more important because libertarianism is fundamentally a movement and an, an individualistic ideology. And the Bill of Rights is, uh, is all about the protections that are afforded to the individual and the stuff that government cannot do to you, that you have an absolute right to, that you have no duty or responsibility to fulfill in order to get that right. You, the, that is simply your right. Government cannot take it from you. And to me, that is, that is the core of, uh, of, uh, of the libertarian worldview. And to, we have to keep going back to that and, and pushing that. Yes, of course, we talk about the separation of powers. And of course, it's important. We don't have to choose between these things. But if we do have to choose, it's the Bill of Rights and the individual protections, all 10 of them, uh, that, uh, that it uh, affords to us. Uh, I feel like uh, there needs to be an over, a, a, a course correction in realizing the separation of powers stuff. Like just basic, should this level of government be doing this thing? How much does that thing cost? How much do you weigh it? That is just so much out of all politics these days that it's that it's a, a grotesquerie is my feeling. Uh, let's make a um, general question, but I'll direct it at Peter for reasons that will become obvious. Kevin from Cedar Rapids, great sound, uh, says over the past year, what cultural recommendation either was way better than you thought it would be or didn't live up to the hype or... What is one thing you are looking forward to in the coming year from a cultural standpoint? Dune 2. It's, that's what you're looking forward to. That's what I'm looking and forward that's to. that's all you're answering. You're not, that's my answer. Yes. No disappointment. Dune 2. Can I say my answer to the first part is Dune 1 and my answer to the mm. second part is Dune that, 2? So Dune no. 1 was 2021, so that's not the past oh, year. Oh, whatever. Oh, come, come on. on. Dune Calendars. 1. I, re I resist your calendar stingle. tyranny. Nick lives or single in the, in the diaper saying, I will kill you. Uh, I will kill him. So good. Yeah. I will kill him. Uh, Nick, you live a life of uh, perpetual disappointment. What was your uh, favorite disappointment? I, uh, I don't know that I had a, a – no, I didn't have any real uh, super you surprising disappointment. You didn't expect anything disappoint. from Scorsese. And so you, yeah, yeah, no. So that's like, you know, that was part Nick's of the course. Nick's expectations are perfectly yeah. calibrated, Matt. Don't no, worry. Not, uh, not quite, but I really enjoyed seeing Bob Dylan uh, more than I thought I would. Uh, to be honest. And uh, I also, uh, I just, uh, we just dropped a podcast with uh, Sandra Newman, uh, Sandra Newman, the uh, author of a new novel called Julia, which is a retelling of 1984 from Julia's point of view, Winston Smith's lover who's in the junior anti-sex league. 
And when I heard that the book was announced, I was like, that's going to be great. And it's so much better than that. Like, it's just, I get chills thinking about it. It's just such a good, dark, gloomy, and, uh, you know, transcendent novel. Uh, my, uh, better than I could have ever thought it might be would be The Baseball Project, which I think one uh, letter writer mentioned. Uh, I liked it. It's fun. Uh, band, rock band, former R.E.M. guys and other people doing songs about baseball. It's super dorky and wrong, and I like them. Uh, and the thing that I'm looking for from a cultural, but actually more political standpoint, uh, next year um, is uh, in in a dark, morose way. I'm looking forward to the uh, Democratic convention in Chicago. <laughs> what is wrong yeah. with you? Because no. that's not okay. Going this to is be you talk about Dune show. One versus Dune Two, <laughs> this right? Is, this is talk about staying on sequel. a pole. Yeah, My God. yeah, I will. Uh, that's, wow. it's going to be an absolute nightmare. What an idiotic choice, uh, a, a country. In the Can I throw in, in yeah. a completely useless baseball rock tie in Matt? Well, yes, please. The album by the Naz, <laughs> Todd Rundgren's original band that never got released as such was called Fungo Bat. Wow. See what I tell you? Catherine, sit up straight. Leslie Peterson has a question You're not for you. Not my real dad. Hi, <laughs> Tablers. I'm almost always a good live and let live libertarian. I think I saw that James Bond movie. But there is one thing that puts me in full authoritarian hand me the civil asset forfeiture stick mode. Sports cars and motorcycles that are intentionally tuned oh, wow. loud yeah. for maximum horsepower. I fully admit I am not being harmed by them. I'm being super duper annoyed. <laughs> Please help me with a rationale for public nuisance punishment for these horrible humans that allows me to retain my small L libertarian card. Leslie Peterson, who also adds uh, more segment titles, please. I knew you weren't a libertarian, Leslie, and that just proves it. Just kidding. Thank Catherine, you. what's Thank up? you so much. I appreciate this question and now want to regulate loud vehicles. Uh, <laughs> Leslie is being harmed. Leslie is downplaying uh, the real answer to her question, which is that she is, she is absolutely uh, bearing a cost that is imposed on her by the loud sports cars. It is a negative externality of their behavior. And I feel like if anyone can solve this, it is Robert W. Poole. I think what we need is micropayments for loud engines. And I don't know exactly how to do this, but like the technology is coming, Matt, and maybe Elon Musk is going to give it to us, which will prove all of his critics right that actually uh, his like libertarian intentions will end in a dark authoritarian dystopia. But um, I would feel way better about the loud mufflerless garbage outside my window if I knew I was just getting like, I don't know, a quarter every time I had to hear it. And um, you should be able to do that. We got easy passes. Figure it out. So chat GPT, right? The AI of the future is actually just going to record this and will then extract from the car's bank account. But actually, that's not going to happen. And technology will solve this problem because one one of the best things about EVs, from my perspective, is that they are, in fact, quite quiet and a world in which most vehicles on the road are electric vehicles. Uh, we we might complain about the subsidies and we might complain about a, a bunch of the sort of regulatory policy environment in which EVs are being developed right now. But EVs are so much quieter. And when we get to a world where most vehicles are EVs, that is going to be a much quieter world that will afford us much more concentration. But won't that world also contain people who somehow get their EVs to make a big, loud, fake motor yeah. sound? Yes. Because people want it. Yeah. Probably. But yes. that big, loud motor sound might be more easily privatizable and not. Maybe you can only hear it inside the car. Do you want Ooh. to uh, go out and grab a smoke? Yeah. Well, uh, for a while. Uh, I am going to uh, read a question here that's another uh, conundrum to solve. We'll have Dr. Nick Gillespie uh, tackle. This comes from Joshua Vilgerin. Uh, hello, Gillespie et al. We are the ets and the alls. Uh, longtime viewer and the youngest subscriber to the Print Reason magazine here. I question that. At age 45. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Before the question, I want to thank you guys, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and my question is about what the correct solution is for the situation in elite institutions, particularly law schools. I'll be entering law school next year, hoping to acquire a federal clerkship, even shooting for the Supreme Court oh, upon graduation, which essentially requires me to participate in a law review. Every single university I'm considering accepting from the University of Virginia to Columbia has an incredibly one-sided skew in every 
period, single period research article posted by their flagship journals. I believe that as a libertarian, my only choices are to silence my own views when applying to and writing for a law review or to be honest and lose all chance of being accepted. I'm conflicted between my belief that the government shouldn't get involved in university processes, especially student-led ones, and the impossibility of this exclusion of libertarian and right-wing ideas ever changing on its own. What is your proposed solution to this conundrum, Dr. Gillespie? Uh, well, first, to maybe uh, maybe the problem is uh, as bad as you think, since there's a lot of uh, you know supposedly unpopular uh, views on the Supreme Court as we sit. So, you know, my sense of things, and I flirted with academia. It's like you can never, you should never hide what you truly believe. Um, you know, in your academic work or or in your journalism. Like if you're not, if you don't believe what you're writing in. Your work is going to suck anyway, but you just got to go and try and uh, beat the institution by being more brilliant than other people if your view is heterodox or in the minority. I'm reading uh, Jennifer Byrne's new biography of Milton Friedman, The Last Conservative, and uh, which is a fascinating and, and brilliant book about a fascinating and brilliant person and his, and all of the people around him. How did he succeed? His His views were never popular he persisted and he won over arguments. So I think that's, you know, there's no way but uh, being who you are and then being better than the people around you. You can also organize. And this is what the Federalist Society has done is make a, a kind of institutional space within the world of, uh, of law for people who are not liberals, who are not progressives, who are not on the left. And organizing other people who view, who have the same views, right? And I don't mean organize in a sort of like, we're going to get legal protections. I mean, create institutions, create forums, create places for people to feel safe and uh, and view that as part of your mission in, uh, you know, in whatever institution or academic field that you go into. I also did not do this because I was too dumb, but um, you can avoid using labels. I think that is permissible subterfuge. So say what you believe, but don't go out of your way to say, I'm a libertarian. Like That's fine because for a, the vast majority of people, it's the label that they're going to be turned off by. And if you just make a compelling case for any individual thing at any individual time, I think that gives you a big advantage and that you know, as Nick said, even can sort of um, my former boss, John Tierney, who came up uh, in The New York Times, was just a libertarian, but he just usually didn't use that word. And so people were like, oh, my God, he has so many interesting and unusual ideas. Where does this guy keep coming up with these? Ideas? And it was it was actually playing the homogeneity of the institution to your advantage. It wouldn't even occur to them to ask, are you not what we all are? Um so that might be a, an option as well. As a libertarian, I think that's a very good idea. I think there's always place, uh, there's always going to be some tiny little appetite in even the most academic context for uh, someone who is a good contrarian of what the most popular thing. I remember I wasn't a good contrarian. I wasn't a good student. But when I was in film school at UC Santa Barbara, um, you know, I was always the guy who would write the the only moral character in Rear Window is the guy who killed his wife, that kind of crap. And they <laughs> ate it up. They loved it. Yeah. They loved it. And I, Raymond Burr. And, uh, Raymond Burr. Yeah. Yeah. Ironside. Old Ironside. Um, I'm going to make an executive decision right now and say this is our last question. And let's, uh, we've been going for more than an hour. We can, um, you know, have our final closing statements if we so choose and, and, and such like. But mm -hmm. this is a good thing for us to chew on, perhaps. Uh, is it another Raymond Burr question? Uh, every question yeah. that is it not explicitly be. about Satan yeah, yeah. is about Raymond Burr. Larry Samuels. Why? That's not a hard word. Samuels. <laughs> Samuels. That's how we do it. Shut it. Uh, big thanks to you all at the Reason Roundtable for your podcast. Here's my question. Um, the 250th anniversary of the United States is not that far off. 2026. Um, what what sort of celebratory events would you like to see as part of this? I suppose the term events can include such things as passing or even removing laws. Uh, Nick and I are old enough to remember how glorious uh, 1976 was. Yeah, yeah, the bicentennial. I, w I would like to answer for Nick. Can I guess what Nick's yeah, answer is going to be? Yeah, what I'm going to say. It's, yeah. it's a reboot of the musical 1776. Oh, that would be good. Yeah. And uh, the With tricky- With an all Latino The, the yeah, tricky right? part Nudes is it has ice. to be rebooted <laughs> not in Hamilton style. It has yeah. to be a non-woke reboot of 1776 that somehow 
becomes mainstream. That is my one and only wish, and I believe it is Nick's one and only no, wish. No, I, I, that is great. I, I would go with that. I was going to say I, what I want the reboot is of the tall ships. Yeah, uh, and I Ooh. growing up on the uh, you know on uh, near the beach in New Jersey where a lot of the tall ships came. Uh, it was so stupid. And then the funniest thing, and Matt, you'll recall this. It was a simpler, worse America, but. Uh, where Polish jokes were popular, yeah, Polish, uh, yeah. and uh, the Polish ships showed up like a year later, <laughs> which was like, okay, you're doing it to yourself now. You know, don't blame us. We're just, you know. What is uh, what is Catherine's Catherine answer? I I just got so excited about the 1776 yeah, reboot. I don't have bad. anything yeah. else. Yeah. Um, uh, an all woman reboot. Oh. 1776, right? No, yeah. again, again, I, we have to resist the call to go Hamilton yeah. style. America does not need. You have the husband Dolly Madison version. <laughs> oh, the first gentleman, first this gentleman is, this role. This is just all writing itself. It's, as we it go. is writing itself, but yeah. they have to keep the songs exactly the same, including "Cool, Cool Conservative Men." What is it? Cool, and then also yeah, the yeah, song yeah. where it's, they choose the national bird right, right. with the yeah, turkey, the, yeah. the turkey round. Um, I don't know. I'm just happy for America to have a nice birthday. Honestly, we weren't sure we were going to make it. I think it should be a, a special issue of Rees Magazine. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's 250 pages long. <laughs> yeah. How about that? Uh, yeah. How? How dare you? Yeah. <laughs> you know what would be a, a fun project to think of? I mean, not for reason necessarily, but what you know? what is the definition of what it means to be American? Why wouldn't that be and, for reason? Well, I mean, it could be. I'm just saying it for for yeah, I know you hate when I bring up the idea of we need better conversations or discussions. But the national conversation I'm thinking of for our Florida issue, which is really fantastic. I interviewed Jeb Bush and we ended up talking about, OK, you know, what's the identity for America? You know, it's clear that we're no lo we no longer think of ourselves primarily as a nation of immigrants, even though we have more foreign born people you know, than we've had in 100 years. Uh, we don't really think of ourselves in terms of like 19th century identities, et cetera. And like we ne we need a good answer to that. Like what's something that's loose enough that binds us all together, but is also kind of uh, permeable enough so that it it you know it it allows for a lot of uh, individualization. I think what we need, Peter, and you'll back me up on this, is um, uh, uh, a a movie or a series of movies. Um, in which uh, various uh, key uh, founding uh, fathers and figures um, just show up in the present and have to make do and, and try to like do their politics in the current situation. You want a George Mason time heist yeah. film? No, yep. I want to see John C. Calhoun dropped in Harlem. Yeah. Like and it's just, like, I that movie get is home. so short. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He doesn't yeah. speak Spanish, so that'll be a problem. Uh, I what, think we had that movie already, and it was called Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. That's true. That's true. And also- On uh, the other hand, maybe that's what Sherman. I want for America in, yeah. in two years is just for everybody, two and a half, two, two years and a month, is for everyone to watch Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey and just- Chill out you for a little while. You are just setting your sights lower by the second, Peter Suderman. No, uh, it's, uh, everybody should try a little bit of James E. Pepper 1776 Rye. It's 100 proof. It's pretty affordable. It's tasty. And it's thematically appropriate. That's what I want for America. I just want uh, us to reclaim uh, or go back to 1976 uh, schlocky patriotic fashion. So yeah, just yeah, like yeah. Uh, red, white, and blue dolphin shorts, oh, and yeah, yeah, like uh, really and like tube socks and roller skates and stuff. Yeah. My dad, uh, who was <laughs> a, an English grad student in the 1970s, uh, before he was my father, had a pair of custom-made American flag bell bottoms. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think my dad had those too. Um, <laughs> Sester Centennial is the word for the 250th oh, wow. anniversary. Like that a little bit too much. Which I will be using aggressively <laughs> that year. Uh, all right. Well, thank you all for your questions. Sorry you didn't get to all of them, but you, that would take 10 hours. Um, and even we don't like each other's company for 10 consecutive hours, at least while we're videotaping. Um, Catherine, do you want to give a, a closing a, a statement? Do you want to tell us what we've learned today? <laughs> the real libertarianism is the friends we made along the way. Not wrong. It's not wrong, actually. Uh, yeah, I'll go with that. Um, the real libertarianism is the friends we made along the way. Uh, as Peter said at the beginning, uh, what we do here at Reason is mostly people, but also uh, the people on staff, but also um, 
y'alls out there in TV land and podcast land and uh, reading your magazine on the toilet land and whoever else you are. Um, these questions are always great. Like I always have a little warm, fuzzy moment where like I am delighted by the weird and deep and like very personally important questions that people send in for this thing. Um, and this is these are the questions we try to keep in mind when we do our journalism every day. Um, I am I am hoping that we will carry some of the spirit of this into the next year. And I'm hoping that we can do that with your support. Beautiful. Nick, anything to add? Peter, anything to add? You have to sing in harmony is what I'm saying. Yeah, well, I'm out. No, I just uh, thank you for everybody who uh, reads our stuff and shares it and people who support it. It's great. And we can't do it without you. So thank you very much. Thanks for reading. Thanks for listening. Thanks for supporting us. Uh, and yes, and thanks for getting to the end of this uh, special bonus videotaped uh, uh, edition of the uh, of is it called videotape? No, absolutely well, not. Nor well, is a Zoom a call, but you're incorrigible. We're putting it on laserdisc. Uh, it sounds great. Uh, thanks, and please tune in on our normal Mondays for our normal Monday behaviors, and go to reason.com/slash/donate. Do it today. You'll be glad you did.